Hey Parkway family, this is the Satterfields and we are so glad to join you in worship today. We have our children with us. Kids, can you say hi? Hi! We have really enjoyed having some quality time together as a family, but we are all looking forward to seeing all of you and your faces again at church. Um, one of the things that we've been doing with our quality time together is the Happy Surprise Challenge. And all of our girls participated in doing some sidewalk art for our grandparents. Girls, did y'all have a good time doing that? Yeah! yeah. It was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Um, and now we're gonna present to you some more of our Parkway children doing acts of worship with their Happy Surprise Challenge. Roll, Roll on! on. Oh, 
takes me places like to the nail salon. I love my mother because she does the chores that I don't want to do. She takes me to school and she buys me stuff. I love my mom because she does the dishes and uh, she does my nasty laundry. Because she's fun, funny. I love my mom because she loves me. She fixes me food. I love my mom because she's nice to me and she buys me cheeseburgers. She likes to kiss me. She tells me about Jesus and she loves me. And she cares for me. Love you, Mommy. I love my mom because she cares so well, she loves so well, she's been there for me through everything. I love my mother because she is selfless and always puts God and her family first. Since I've been at school, she's always been one phone call away and I know that I can always count on her. I love you, Mom. One reason I love my mom is because she is a prayer warrior. And it's just so encouraging to know that your mom is lifting you up in prayer every day, no matter what you're going through. At 37 years old, I had a set of twin boys. Needed help. My mother came from North Carolina to visit us for a while. And when she left, I didn't realize it would be the last time I'd ever see her on this earth. Every now and then, I'd say, Lord, please, Tell my mother I do appreciate her so much and love her. I love my mother because she has superpowers. I love my mother because she always asks my opinion and she's always there for me. Matter of fact, she could see into the future because she'd tell you real quick what was going to happen if you didn't straighten up. I love my mom because uh, my mom is the most selfless person that I've ever known. And she could also, she had super hearing. When I was older and I'd come in a little bit later, she would always hear me and she would always get up and come and hug me and kiss me goodnight. I love my mother because she never stopped praying for me. She believed and prayed for me in a time when I didn't believe in myself. She had a joy about her, literally brightened the room. You know, there's a lot of great moms out there, but I wouldn't trade my mom for anyone. She had a peace that passed all understanding. I love my mom because of the example she set for me to always put Jesus first in my life and to secondly put others before myself because she's one of the most selfless people I've ever known. She was patient, not just with those that she loved, but with strangers and other people. She exemplified for me her love for God and her sacrificial love for her husband and her children. And she had a, a goodness and a gentleness that surpassed anything that I've ever been able to understand. Most of all, I love my mom because she helped me understand the love Jesus has for an eight-year-old boy. Faithful to her husband, faithful to her family and friends, faithful to her God. Pray with me. Father, we give you praise and thanks for our mothers. Mothers that uh, listen to you and cherish your word and abide by it. God, I lift them up to you. I pray for each of them. I pray for their health, for their strength, and for their sanity. We are so grateful for their love, their sacrifice, and their guidance in our lives as they have provided for us and nurtured us throughout the years. Lord, I just thank you for mothers that, that turn their heart over you, that don't believe in self-will, but believe in the Father's will. God, I pray that you will give each of them guidance today and in the days ahead. Father, would you continue to provide your spiritual wisdom to all of our Christian mothers living today? Continue to be the best mother that they can be and give them an extra dose of blessing and love today. And Lord, would you continue to bless our Christian moms as they work to follow after Jesus 
and serve him every day of their lives. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Troubles come and my heart burdened be. Then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise God, we do thank you that you do lift us up. And we thank you for the mothers that follow your example. Lord, we ask you to bless them today. And as we open your word today, we ask God that you speak to us afresh and anew, that we can leave today with a piece of, of your word that will keep us going this next week and encourage us so that we can encourage others to be about your kingdom. Father, we thank you for being a great God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to welcome you to this time of worship at Parkway and especially say Happy Mother's Day to all our mothers who are watching today. 
Uh, normally, our sanctuary here would be filled with moms along with their children celebrating and rejoicing in this good day. And even though we cannot yet physically meet together, I know that moms are being appreciated and loved all throughout our congregation and beyond. So moms, we want to say happy Mother's Day to you today. I want to invite everyone to take a Bible, if you have one handy, and turn with us again to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. We are continuing our study on the Beatitudes. And we have noticed and we're noticing that they build on each other. We began with the foundation of blessed are the poor in spirit. We must be spiritually bankrupt before God. We must come with nothing in our hands if we want to live a truly blessed life. To give ourselves completely without reservation, total surrender to Him. Last week we looked at blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted because when we're spiritually bankrupt it leads to brokenness in our lives over our sinful condition. And when we have got to that place Jesus takes us to another level today in this third beatitude we look at found in Matthew chapter 5 verse 5. And as we've been doing, I'd ask you wherever you are to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word, just this one verse. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to ask you, as we've done the last two weeks, to repeat it after me uh, out loud. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Would you say that out loud with me? Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth the earth. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, most importantly, live it out in your life. You may be seated wherever you are, and thank you for your participation. A college football coach asked one of his former players one time to help him in his recruiting of new players to their university. The star who was now in the NFL said, sure, coach, I'll be glad to help. What kind of guy are you looking for? And the coach says, well, you know, there's that fella that if you knock him down, he stays down. And the star says, we don't want him, do we, coach? And he says, no, that's not who we're looking for. The coach said, you know, there's that fella that if you knock him down, he gets up. But if you knock him down again, he stays down. The star says, we don't want him either, do we? And the coach says, no, that's not who we're looking for. The coach says, well, you know, there's that fellow, when you knock him down, he gets up. When you knock him down, he gets up. You knock him down, he keeps getting up. Uh, no matter how many times you knock him down, he gets back up. And the star says, ah, coach, that's the guy we're looking for, isn't it? The coach says, no, we're not looking for him either. I want you to go out and find me the guy that's knocking everybody down. That's the person we're looking for for our team. Well, I tell that story because I believe it illustrates the kind of world we live in today, doesn't it? Everyone pushing and shoving and knocking down anyone who gets in their way because we all want to be on top. If we were to summarize the unwritten rule of American life, whether it's professional football or the school playground, whether it's big business or a kid's lemonade stand, whether it's the halls of Congress or even a PTA meeting, what would that unwritten rule be in America today? Well, I think it would be this, the strong rule the weak. Look out for number one. Don't stoop for anything or anybody. Never place yourself below others. Never give up your rights. Never let somebody else get the best of you. No, our culture honors strength and power, ability, self-assurance, initiative, aggressiveness. But here in our text today, Jesus comes with a different message than what our world is proclaiming. He says, blessed are the meek. Now let's slow down and read that one more time. Did Jesus really say what we think he said? Blessed are the meek? Surely that's not what he said. and Surely that's not what he meant. I mean, who wants to be known as meek? That's not how you want to be described. That's not something you want to put 
on your resume. Uh, that's not what you want to be known for. If you look for synonyms in a dictionary, other words for meek include these. Mild, calm, gentle, tame, docile, soft, spineless, passive. When we think about the word meek or meekness, we associate it with something that's negative. Nobody wants to be called meek, and neither would I if that's in fact what Jesus means here. So let's look to try to find and discover what he's saying to us when he says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. There are four things in particular that I want you to take note of as we continue in this journey of how to live a truly blessed life. Not as the world defines it, but as Jesus defines it. The first thing we need to understand when we look at this beatitude is this. Meekness is not weakness. Now I've already shared how the world looks at this word. To be meek means that you're soft, you're passive, you're weak. But when Jesus says, blessed are the meek, he's using the Greek word pros, and it means power or strength under control. It pictures a powerful animal that has been tamed and is now under the control of its master, like a horse that was wild but has now been broken and has been brought under control to fulfill a purpose. We actually have a letter from a Roman soldier written to his wife back during Jesus' day. He's out on the battlefield, and when he writes to his wife, he tells her all the things that are going on. But a part of his letter describes a new horse that he has gotten. It is a stallion. It's a real war horse, an incredible specimen of strength. And listen to how he describes this new horse to his wife. He, he writes, This stallion is more powerful than any horse I have ever seen. And yet it is so gentle a woman could ride on its back or children play underneath its belly without worry. It truly is, and listen to the word he uses to describe it, it truly is a meek horse. Now, was he describing a weakling? No. This was a war horse. I mean, this was a, a stallion with unbelievable strength. It had get up and go. It had horsepower, literally, if you will. Why would he describe it as meek? Because that horse that he rode had a bit in its mouth that was connected to a, a bridle and some reins that were in the soldier's hands. All he had to do to control that magnificent animal was to pull the reins in a certain way for that horse to go to the right or to the left, to, to, to go or to stop. And the horse would respond to his leading. The bridle and the reins didn't make the horse weaker. In fact, it made the horse stronger. Because now the horse's strength and power was being directed in the best way possible. That's meekness. It's not weakness, but rather it's strength. And it's strength under control. So the question we ask this morning is this. Who has the reins of your life? Are you under the control of someone other than yourself? The blessed life, I believe, begins when we put our lives under the control of Jesus Christ. It doesn't make you weaker. You're still the same person. You still have your personality. You still have your gifts and abilities. You still have your energy. But when Jesus walks into your life and becomes your Lord, your life is now directed and controlled in the most effective way possible. I believe that you will never be at your absolute best until you are under the control of the one who made you, of the one who created you, the one who gives you your life. Meekness is strength under control. When I think of this characteristic, I think of the Apostle Paul, 
who was a literal wild man as a rabbi. I mean, he's out there promoting and defending the law. He is running down Christians to arrest them, even uh, kill them. But one day he meets Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. And what happens to him? He becomes a church mouse, right? He never says anything uh, ever again. He just keeps his mouth quietly shut. No, he's just as crazy on the other side of his conversion as he was before, except now he is crazy about Jesus. He's out there winning people to Christ and proclaiming the gospel, and, con and he continues to impact lives even to this very day. It was all possible because his unbelievable strength of spirit and soul was brought under control of Jesus Christ. I want you to know today God has given each of us an unbelievable spirit. He's put within us drive and passion and, and energy that can be used for good or it can be used for bad. What God has placed inside of us can be used to touch others and make them better or it can be used to hurt others and tear them down. It depends whether or not your spirit is under the control of Jesus. We can take the energy that God has given us and, and make a difference in our world for good, or we can waste our lives and make them of no help or consequence at all. Meekness is to put our strength, the strength that God has blessed us with, under the control of Jesus Christ and let him lead us and direct us in the way we should go. Here's the takeaway for today's message. You are never going to be better than when Jesus has the reins of your life. You're never going to live more effectively than when Jesus is in control of your life. Meekness is not weakness. It is strength under control. The second thing we need to understand from this beatitude is this. Meekness must then be expressed. Jesus, I believe, is our best example of meekness in action. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, and 29, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am what? I am pros. I am meek. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Again, when people hear that Jesus is meek, they get this picture of him being a weakling, being a wimp, being the kind of person that if someone were to say boo to, he would turn and run. But that's not how I picture Jesus Christ. Obviously, I don't have a picture of him, but I believe from the description of him in Scripture, he was a man's man. He wasn't a doormat for anybody to walk over. I believe he had muscular arms and legs. I think he had dirt under his fingernails. He was strong enough to single-handedly drive the crooks out of the temple who were making a mockery of God's house in their buying and selling of sacrifices. He was brave enough to stand in the middle of a storm and say, peace, be still. He was powerful enough to confront a man that was possessed by the strongest demons of hell itself and drive them out with just his words. He was the kind of man that rough and tough fishermen admired and chose to follow and even die for. That's a picture of our meek Jesus. Strength under control. And that meekness was expressed visibly and powerfully. When Satan appeared to him, tempting him in the wilderness, Jesus could have killed him with a single thought, but he kept his strength under control. When the Pharisees ridiculed him and constantly sought to tear him down at every turn, Jesus could have destroyed them immediately, but he kept his strength under control. When he was on the cross, the Bible says that he could have called 12 legions of angels, 72,000 angelic warriors to come and save him. But again, 
He kept his strength under control. Jesus had all power in heaven and on earth available to him, but he kept his strength under his Father's control to do his will and to fulfill his purpose. Paul describes Jesus that even though he was in very nature God, he didn't He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but rather made himself nothing and took on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So when we look at Jesus' life, instead of focusing on the powerful and influential, we see him helping the weak and the outcast. Instead of showing off by riding on a big white horse, we see him on the back of a humble donkey. Instead of letting others serve him, we see him drop to his knees and serve them by washing their feet. Instead of condemning others for their sins, we see him mending broken lives and dispensing forgiveness and restoring hope. Instead of the focus being on himself and taking care of his own needs, we see him die on a cross and pour himself out completely for others. And it was all because he was totally surrendered and yielded to his Father's will. Now, where do you suppose Jesus first learned that trait? I think it was seeing meekness modeled and practiced by his mother, Mary. We remember Mary's story, don't we? Uh, She is a good, faithful Jewish girl just minding her own business when one day the angel Gabriel appears to her and he tells her that she has been chosen to be the mother of the long-awaited Messiah. She's likely just a teenager at this point, but do you remember what Mary's response was to the angel? She said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. That's a picture of genuine meekness. It's putting your life under the control of God. And Mary didn't stop there. She continued to be fully yielded to God as she raised Jesus as her son. She was the one, no doubt, to teach him his first prayers to pray. She was the one to give him a love for the scriptures. She was the one to impart to him the things of God. She was the one to teach him how to truly live a meek life. Moms, on this day, when we especially honor you, never forget or take for granted just how important your investment in your children really is. One of the reasons I believe Jesus practiced meekness in his life was because he saw it displayed visibly in his mom's life. Moms, I hope you'll do the same for your children. Meekness must be expressed. And then third thing we need to understand as we look at this beatitude is that meekness is not natural. It just doesn't happen automatically in us. We must cultivate this virtue in our lives by submitting our will to Christ's control every day and let him begin to live his supernatural life out through us. It means that we take our wants and desires, we take our hopes and dreams, our ambitions and plans, and we lay them all at his feet and we say the same thing he said to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. Meekness is developed in our lives when we give God control over every area of our lives. It's giving God your time and saying, Lord, how do you want me to spend it for you today? It's giving God your abilities and saying, Lord, where can I make a difference? It's giving God your wallet and saying, God, how much do you want me to give? It's giving God your words and saying, Lord, who do you want me to encourage? It's giving God your touch and saying, Lord, who needs to feel your love? It's giving God your influence and saying, Lord, who can I be an example to? 
It's giving God your life and saying, Lord, how do you want to use me? Never underestimate the power of your life when it is under the control of Jesus Christ. People need to see Christ in us. People need to see the difference His strength makes in our lives as we live it out under His control because the people we encounter every day are broken and bruised, but we have the power to help when we let the supernatural light of Jesus Christ shine through us. Then the fourth thing we need to understand is that meekness will be rewarded. Notice Jesus says, blessed are the meek for what? For they will inherit the earth. You remember how the Israelites went into the promised land and possessed it finally after God had promised it to them? They overcame all their obstacles, they defeated all their enemies, and finally enjoyed fully what God had prepared for them. God promises us that kind of inheritance one day. Every obstacle we've encountered will be eliminated. Every enemy we faced will be vanquished. We will inherit all that God has in store for us. Do you realize that when you're in Christ and you're under His control, that you're an heir of everything that He has on heaven and in earth? The Bible says in one of my favorite verses that our eyes haven't seen, our ears haven't heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love Him. When we live our lives under the control of Jesus Christ, a reward is coming to us one day. As I close, a few years ago, I came across a book that was entitled The Right Stuff, and it was written by a man by the name of Tom Wolf, It was a book about the development of America's space program from the late 1940s uh, until the first flights of the Mercury program that put a man in orbit around the Earth for the first time. When Tom Wolf did his research, he discovered that there was something that the best pilots had that set them apart from others. There was this quality they possess that combine courage and coolness under pressure and supreme confidence in their ability. They had it and others didn't. There was no name for that quality, so Wolf decided to coin his own phrase and he simply called it the right stuff. Those test pilots that were a cut above everybody else had the right stuff that was needed in order to live the kind of life that would send us out into space successfully. Meekness, I believe, is the Christian right stuff that sets us apart from the world. It, too, is courage plus calmness plus confidence It comes when we have an unshakable trust in God and we yield ourselves completely to His control. Blessed are those who have the right stuff, meekness, for they will inherit the earth. As we come to a time of response today, the issue that we grapple with in this beatitude is control. Who or what is going to control you? Who or what is on the throne of your life? Is it you or is it God? The truly blessed life begins when you let go and you let God be in control. When you say, Jesus, take the reins of my life and lead me where you want me to go. My prayer today is that's exactly where you find yourself now. And if not, that you'll use this opportunity right now to relinquish your will and make His will yours. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we come to you today and we thank you 
for the opportunity we have to once again look at your word. And I pray today, Father, that we have learned something about what it means to be meek, that it's not a bad thing, but that it's a positive thing. It's taking the strength of, of who we are, all the energy and personality and abilities and gifts that you've given us, and, and we don't just try to go out and uh, expend it on our own, but rather we put it under your control and we let you be the one to take this strength of character and strength of spirit and soul. When we put it under your control, you lead us in the way that we should go. Father, today I pray that everybody listening to this broadcast would put their life under the control of Jesus. Maybe for the first time, in the quietness of the place wherever they're watching this to say, I realize that my life has been my own. I've called the shots. I've sought to make the decisions, but it's not working out. I'm not truly happy. I'm not truly at peace. But today, I'm going to trust what Jesus says, and I'm going to place my life under his control. And from this point on, I'm going to let him lead me in the way that I should go. Father, help people to make that commitment today. Others of us that have trusted you, some of us many, many years ago, help us to, first of all, be thankful for an example of meekness in the life of our Savior that we can see and that we can follow. Thank you for the example of, of a meek life that could have been seen in maybe our parents, maybe our, our moms, maybe others in our church or friends. Lord, help us to realize that we need to continue every day to cultivate this virtue and trait in our lives and place our lives at your disposal under your total control. God, as you speak to us now, may we respond. Would you take all that we are? Would you take all that we hope to be? And would you make us the people you want us to be? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to me. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Your feet is 
That's exactly where your life will be today, wholly consecrated to the Lord. If you've made a commitment today, we want to hear from you. At the very end of this broadcast, there will be a slide that will give you the information of where you can respond uh, to us. You just write us at staff at parkwaybc.net, and we'll respond to you in the days ahead. Well, today again, happy Mother's Day. And in our church, our tradition is to take up a special offering on Mother's Day that goes to our uh, Tennessee Baptist uh, children's homes. And uh, I want to encourage you, so many of you that have faithfully continued to give your tithes and offerings, first let me say thank you for your faithfulness and your stewardship. But you'll find one of these special envelopes in your offering box, or you can just write on an envelope. And the offerings that we receive for the Tennessee Baptist Children's Home goes to provide care for children who do not have the benefit of having a, a stable home life uh, in, in, at home. So I invite you and encourage you to give your offering. I also want to invite you to be back with us on Wednesday evening as we continue our study on tough times led by Matt Meganson, our Minister of Family Life. Matt, once again, will have a timely message of how we navigate these uncertain times with the strength and power of the Lord. Now today, rather than having a closing chorus that we would sing together, we're going to watch uh, just a few more examples of the happy surprise of our children that they provided uh, for different people over the course of this last week or so. So watch this, enjoy it. God bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you back on Wednesday evening. 